Scientists now working with the Thunderbolts project have proposed a new theory of our solar system and its history. In the relatively recent past, only thousands of years ago, several planets moved on unstable paths and engaged in violent electrical exchanges. However, the apparent clockwork regularity of planetary motions today precludes many scientists from considering planetary instability. But let us consider the evidence that these events did in fact occur. In part one of this extended interview, Thunderbolt's Picture of the Day managing editor Stephen Smith offers an introduction to the theory of planetary catastrophism and the electrical scarring of planets and moons. We begin by asking the question, where did this theory of recent celestial catastrophe come from? It's difficult to say exactly where the idea of electrical scarring arose, since there have been myths as far back as we can trace that talk about gods hurling energetic weapons at one another and striking various objects like the moon or the earth. The myth of uh, Phaeton and Helios comes to mind as an example uh, of an earth-based catastrophic event. Phaeton, as most people realize, stole the sun god's chariot, uh, and he lost control and steered close to Earth, causing a disastrous fire that, uh, according to the Greek myths, was worldwide. So from a scientific standpoint, some early proponents of planetary scarring were probably people like Ignatius Donnelly, who in the late 1800s thought that Earth in particular had suffered a terrible catastrophe involving the approach of a giant comet. And then later, uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky wrote Worlds in Collision, where he proposed a similar catastrophe due to the interaction of planetary bodies with Earth, especially Venus and Mars. The two theories from Donnelly and Velikovsky have been expanded as time has gone on, and uh, they've been modified because planetary probes and uh, solar satellites have made uh, essential discoveries about the electrical nature of planetary plasmaspheres. Each planet and moon in the solar system is pretty much immersed in a sea of a great electric field generated by the sun. And that field is formed because of the action of electrically charged particles streaming through the solar system. And that stream, or actually a storm of particles, is called the solar wind, and it's composed of plasma. And plasma, you hear it often described as the fourth state of matter. But since it makes up more than 99% of the universe, in my opinion, it should be considered the first state of matter. And as I just mentioned, of course, the sun is an example of plasma. Now, the general idea that Earth is somehow an electrical entity is probably thousands of years old. But it's only been in the last hundred years that scientists have given credence to the possibility uh, that we are living in a dynamic solar system where electricity uh, is an important factor. The sun's electric field extends for billions of kilometers and it influences the planets. It influences their motions. It influences how they interact with each other. And it maintains the various uh, charge signatures or electrical potential of each of the planetary bodies. Now, several members of the Thunderbolts group, including Dave Talbot, Wal Thornhill, Mel Acheson, and uh, me for that matter, have come to the conclusion that Earth and other planetary bodies and moons in the solar system were probably impacted by huge bursts of electrical energy sometime in the recent past. And that would be the fairly recent past. And my personal opinion is that what we see on various rocky bodies in our neighborhood was caused by the action of gigantic lightning bolts and clouds of electrically energized plasma rather than asteroid impacts. Scientists on Earth were surprised when space probes returned images of heavily tortured planetary surfaces and enigmatic features that conventional geologists have been unable to explain. Planetary scientists were stunned by images uh, from the first uh, flyby of Mars in 1964, I think it was. That was Mariner 4. And uh, in fact, the giant valley, Ma Valles Marineris on Mars, is named for that mission. It's the Mariner Valley. The surface of Mars was a complete surprise to the mission team. No one thought that Mars would look more like the moon than anywhere else. 
So as far as lunar missions were conducted in the 60s and 70s, more craters on the moon and huge cracks and what they call sinuous rills were discovered there. And sinuous rills are deep canyons on the moon, and they run for a thousand kilometers or more through the terrain. And uh, one of the most puzzling things about the, some of the rills is that they go uphill and downhill. If they were formed from flowing lava, then uh, they certainly defy the laws of physics, that's for sure. So Mars and the Moon have a lot of similar structures. Mars exhibits sinuous rills just like the Moon. They wind across its surface for great distances. And I might say also that uh, the moons of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune uh, also possess nearly identical features. On Jupiter's moon Europa, for example, uh, deep rills nearly cover its entire surface. On Dione, one of Saturn's moons, there are cliff faces that crisscross the landscape. And what they do is they outline gigantic fissures that are many kilometers deep. So you could name practically any moon in the solar system, and I could point out features that are difficult to explain when we rely on conventional theories. For generations, geologists have envisioned planetary landscapes shaped incrementally over eons of time. But does this approach actually explain what we see on Earth and other planetary bodies? Most children are taught geological theories on a simplistic level uh, when they enter elementary school. They're taught about erosion, uh, the principle that wind and rain are natural processes that take millions of years to create the various formations on Earth. I remember being taught that rain is a carbonic acid solution that dissolves rock. It changes it to carbon dioxide and other minerals that get swept down into the rivers and then to the ocean. This weathering is thought by conventional geologists to erode the mountains in time spans that uh, they mark as hundreds of millions of years. And um, that's rain, and then wind is supposed to carry dust particles and sand that scour away cliff faces, slowly eroding them down. Uh, steep valleys are said to gradually become shallow meanders and uh, sharp mountains flatten out into rolling hills that eventually disappear. A freezing water uh, expands, pushing cracks and boulders apart every winter, and after millions of years, they're said to crumble into pebbles that pile up into mountains of gravel and form sandy beaches or desert dunes. But since the earliest days of the Thunderbolts project, there's been a suspicion that something's really wrong with that long, slow view of geology. Now, I know it seems like what I'm saying is far too sweeping and that I'm trying to supplant so-called normal geological processes with unproven uh, hypotheses. But since I, can't, I can only provide a cursory view of these ideas during the interview, uh, it's important to take what I'm saying at face value and the listeners should look into the matter more closely when they have the opportunity. I've written scores of papers that discuss these ideas, so they'd be a good place to start. Some of the most interesting things uh, I've discovered in my research are, uh, for example, forests of mineralized trees under some of the deepest ice in Antarctica. Cores that they've drilled through the ice sometimes contain scorched and petrified wood when it's brought up to the surface. Mineralized trees are also prevalent in the prairie, in the American prairie, and elsewhere in the world. They're called petrified forests. And they often contain thousands of shattered and splintered tree trunks that have been turned to stone. There are fossilized animals uh, in literally unbelievable numbers encased in sedimentary rock that's been hardened into stone. And these deposits are hundreds of meters thick. And you can find millions of fish skeletons that look like they're swimming through sandstone. So I ask, what force can fossilize fish, leaving their skeletons in lifelike postures as if they were killed and turned to stone in an instant? How could it keep them whole without being crushed or scattered? Also, there's anomalous formations on Earth that can't be readily explained. And some of them I've written about would be like the Great Trango Tower in Pakistan. The Brandberg Massif in Namibia. Shiprock, New Mexico, 
Ayers Rock, the Olgas in Australia, Mount Thor on Baffin Island, and Table Mountain in South Africa, for instance. Now, when the Cassini space probe uh, entered orbit around Saturn, it found that several of Saturn's moons also demonstrated electrical scarring. There's signs of electric discharge machining everywhere, cathode sputtering, anode blisters, and sinuous rills. They're cut into those moons. For example, Tethys is a moon of Saturn. It's only about a thousand kilometers in diameter, yet it's got huge scars on its surface in comparison to its size. Saturn's other moons exhibit the same difficulties with scale. Moons of small mass with craters and canyons that are hundreds of kilometers wide. On Tethys, for example, there's Ithaca Chasma and the Odysseus multi-ring formation, as it's called. Now, Odysseus is 400 kilometers wide. And remember, Tethys itself is only 1,000 kilometers in diameter. Odysseus has steep walls. Its interior is flat. It has wide terraces along its walls. And in the center is a circular mountain range. They call it the crown of Tethys, and it's more than five kilometers high and 100 kilometers in diameter. Ithaca Chasma that I just mentioned is a thousand kilometers long and a hundred kilometers wide and it's also two kilometers deep. So since frozen barren airless moons and a warm water-rich oxygen planet like Earth are home to bizarre landforms and structures that defy convention, I think it's a mistake to use Earth-based geological theories as a model for the formation of what we see out there. Rather, I think we should do the exact opposite and use what we find in the solar system to model the topography of Earth. Scientists generally envision only two processes when explaining craters on planetary surfaces, impacts and volcanism. But countless crater formations routinely defy these explanations. As far as craters on planets and moons, those are easy to see because the moon is so close to us that we can get some idea of what a heavily cratered body might look like. But contrary to the um, impact of giant asteroids or extinct volcanoes being the cause of these craters, they have uh, highly anomalous features. For example, they have flat, melted-looking floors. Uh, they have a very steep sidewalls. Now, you would think that uh, an impact would create a conical formation that's rather chaotic looking and not leave vertical sidewalls on the sides of a flat, melted crater floor. There's also a lack of blast debris around the crater. There's no giant fields of boulders and dust uh, starting out with large objects and then tapering off to small objects around these craters. In fact, the surroundings look like they're as clean as the crater floors themselves. There are also um, dendritic ridges extending up the sides, and I know Dave Talbot has done uh, quite a bit of research on dendritic ridges, particularly on Mars. But those same dendritic ridges are found on the Moon, and uh, they're also found on the crater walls uh, on other planetary moons. Some of the craters have ramparts around them. In other words, the crater is inside of a raised mound. And surrounding sometimes these ramparts are moats. They're deep trenches uh, carved around the exterior of the crater walls. Craters uh, often have offset multiple rings, just like I mentioned earlier on Tethys. Craters have central peaks or bulges. Now, a lot of uh, planetary scientists claim that those peaks or bulges are due to what are called what's called rebound effect. That when an asteroid hit, it melted the surroundings and it and it started to rise up, like you sometimes see slow motion films of uh, water drops where they rise up and leave a peak in the center briefly. And they uh, contend that that's been caused by the same sort of rebound effect. However, those central peaks are often steep and sharp. They have um, flat sides. Uh, there, are, there are often multiple peaks. Uh, and a lot of times the bulges in the centers of craters are crisscrossed by deep channels. 
So I don't understand how any of that sort of formation could exist when you're talking about a uh, rebounding liquid that then hardens. You would think it would be a slumped looking, rounded, uh, relatively coherent looking bulge and not these trenched bulges or sharply pointed peaks. Another interesting thing about craters uh, on the moon and other bodies is that they have hexagonal or uh, other polygonal shapes. I've seen craters on Mars, for example, that are square. So I, I have no idea uh, how an impactor is going to um, leave a hexagon or a square when it strikes a solid surface. There's closely spaced chains of craters. You have smaller craters on the rims of larger craters. And in fact, that seems to be a preferred formation. When you look at craters on Mercury, for example, you see these uh, wide angle views that show hundreds of craters within the field. On uh, more than half of them, you see multiple craters on the rims of larger craters. The craters often have scalloped edges too, like uh, they've been cut out with a cookie cutter. And uh, one of the perfect examples of that is Victoria Crater on Mars that a lot of people are probably familiar with. It, it got a lot of press uh, when the Opportunity rover parked on its edge for quite some time. Unbeknownst to many scientists today, experiments with both plasma discharge and electrical discharge machining have reproduced many of the cratering patterns that defy conventional reasoning. Plasma discharges are scalable when you look at formations created in the laboratory, for example, Dr. C.J. Ransom at Vimasat Labs performed several experiments where he blasted different materials with uh, rapid electric discharges at a very short duration. He formed domed craters. In other words, you've got a big old crater with a melted looking interior and a dome in the center, and those uh, formations can be seen on Mars, particularly uh, at the South Pole. He formed bullseye craters, uh, that is uh, craters with multiple rims, one inside the other. He created various sample materials, uh, sandstone and calcium carbonate and other materials that might be found on planets and moons. And when he exposed them to these uh, fast transient electric discharges, uh, he created a lot of different formations that we see. It's not exactly electric discharge machining, but uh, electric discharge machining is an industrial process where they use high energy electrical discharges to machine metal. And they use it because it uh, gouges out tiny little pits in the metal, leaving uh, very, very smooth surfaces. So they can make uh, very complex metallic forms that don't require a lot of finishing. And when you look at some of these surfaces under an electron microscope and then compare, uh, for example, some of the formations on Mars, uh, it looks, uh, you could almost tell that Mars must have also been electrically discharged machined. Since the Earth and all of the bodies within the Sun's electrical domain are electrically charged, it is not surprising that we see ample proof of electrical scarring happening today on a smaller scale. You do see electrical scarring, as I would call it, on uh, comets, for example. I would say that we've been fortunate in this time that we've been able to send spacecraft out to different comets and observe their features. Uh, one of them uh, that Wal Thornhill wrote about extensively was uh, Comet Vild 2. And Vild 2 is a perfect example of the electric discharge machining hypothesis uh, because its surface, rather than being uh, a slushy snowball with a bit of dirt in it, looks like it's hot and dry, more like an asteroid. And uh, when you look at its surface and compare it to some of these electric discharge machined metals, uh, they look very similar.
the comet Hartley 2 also revealed what could be considered uh, an active process of electric discharge machining on its surface because one of its ends was glowing brightly uh, as if it was being eroded by a plasma discharge. We didn't get any close-up views of that end of the comet, but uh, surrounding it was a cloud of ultrafine dust uh, that had been presumably machined off the surface. Now, also, you can look at um, moons like Io, uh, Jupiter's moon Io, and you can see that there are what they call volcanoes on its surface. But these volcanoes are so hot that any imaging by any spacecraft of these formations has overloaded the camera because they're so bright. In fact, all the images that you see uh, on the web of uh, Io's volcanoes are false color because the camera imaging system simply could not resolve the interior. They were so bright. Now, uh, as Wall Thornhill has pointed out, because these formations tend to move around on Io, these are probably the touchdown points of vast electric circuits that are occurring between Io and Jupiter. And in fact, um, Io moves through the magnetosphere of Jupiter, and it acts like uh, an induction motor. It's actually creating current flow between it and Jupiter that are millions of amperes in power. So I would say that Io and uh, uh, Vil2 and Comet Hartley and as well as, uh, for example, Saturn's moon Enceladus with its bright plumes of vapor that are being machined off its surface are uh, excellent examples of what might be happening currently in the solar system. However, I should point out that some of the things that I've been discussing on Mars and Earth and Venus or Mercury, uh, those events are orders of magnitude greater than anything we can see now because uh, we're presuming a solar system that was far more electrically active at some time in the past.